<laughs> All right, everybody. We've got a lot that we're going to just jump in with both feet first uh, as we start the story today. Um, so we're just going to get started here. Where are we in the story? Today, we are going to be in the creation era, okay? This is uh, what we're going to be showing every single week so you can kind of track along with the scope of Scripture so you know where we're going to be. We're starting out at the beginning talking about the origins of family. All right, so for the next couple weeks, this entire uh, mini-series inside the larger thing is going to be all about family stuff. Uh, today we're going to talk about where family and marriage and all that came from. Then we're going to talk about husband-wife relationships next week. Then we're going to talk about, like, uh, parent-child relationships. And then we're going to talk about, like, sibling stuff. All right, so we're going to be unpacking a lot of this from the book of Genesis in the creation and the patriarch era, okay? So, you got your Bible. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 through 31, and 2, 15 to 25, all right? So, like, page 2, I think, you know? We're literally at the very beginning of everything. Cool. We're not going to read all of this. We're going to jump around as we go. But this is where we're going to be today. Genesis 1, 26 to 31. At 2, 15 to 25. Now, in order to frame today, I want you to know where we're going with this. And the short answer is that marriage was God's idea. Okay? And we're going to see that as we unpack the beginning of family, the origins of family, the creation account of where all this stuff came from. All right? So we're not going to talk about penguins and dentists and becoming one simply. But we are going to talk about that marriage was God's idea. And we're going to see where that came from. So if you would, stand up, rock it up, let's pray. And then we'll get going. <clears throat> cool, let's go. Daddy, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for this church and that as one body, as a unified people, we are going after Scripture in the same way. We want our people to know your story. We want our people to know how their story fits into your story. And so I pray today as we kick this off, talking about the origins of family, that you would bless this time. You would bless the people that are here and that you would just open up our hearts, open up our eyes, our ears, our minds so that we can receive the truth from your word because you love us, God. And you want us to know you according to your word. And so I pray I get started off well right here, right now today. We love you. In your name, amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Okay, so, uh, you got your Bibles, look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through, what did I say? We're just going to do through 29 on this, or 28. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read this. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then here's a poem. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then we pick up the narrative again. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So today, we're, we start off seeing right off the bat that marriage is God's idea. He creates people. He creates the male and female. He brings them together, and then he blesses them. All right, and that's one of the things I want to point out that, that you see right away is that in, in this story, we see creation and we see blessing. We see God being creative and having fun, and then we see him turning that around and saying, now guess what? Now you get to go and do the same. You get to be creative. You get to have fun in your relationships, in your marriages, and things like that. All right? So in God's creation, if you know the creation account, how does he finish every day? What does he say? He said, and the Lord God looked and saw that it was good. Every day it ends that way. He saw and it was good. He never says oops. All right? He doesn't say oops even when he makes mosquitoes, even when he makes great whites, even when he makes poison ivy, even when he makes cats, even when he makes cheesecake, even when he makes country music. He doesn't say oops. He says it's good. And especially when it comes to you and me, he says 
this is good. And when he creates relationship, he says, this is good. All right? God is having fun during this part of history, creating things like armadillos and pandas and you and me. All right? Uh, I think that just died on me, didn't it? Yeah, it did. That's all right. We'll get it back up there. So I want you to notice, go back to Genesis chapter 1 and look in, I believe it's 27, I think, where the poem is. We're back good. We're back. So when he creates us, look at the words that are used to describe how he creates people. In the image of God, male and female, so that they may rule. All right? So he gives us identity and he gives us a direction right off the bat. All right, God creates man and woman to be together in marriage, and then he starts to have fun with it. Because the next thing he says, God bless them. God created, and then God blesses. As soon as they come forth, and he's like, all right, now this is going to get really good. He blesses them. And the way that it says he blesses them is what? Be fruitful and multiply or increase in number. All right? And then he says, fill the earth and rule. But before we start unpacking this more, we got to see how God got there. How did he get to that point? Because chapter one is like a broad sweeping overview. Chapter two comes back in and kind of fills in the gaps with more parts of the story. Okay, So how did we get there? Let's look at 2.18. All right? What does 2.18 say? It should be the next page or next paragraph or whatever. 2.18. When you get there, stare at me with cross eyes. You can't do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Genesis 2.18. It says this. The Lord God said, it's not good. For the man to be alone, I will make a helper suitable for him. I know this is great. This is a, a quote from a guy named Richard Phillips, who was a former tank commander, and he wrote a book called The Masculine Mandate, which I'm going to reference a ton today. But this is great. He says, God did not call Eve a companion to Adam, because that would suggest the primary purpose of mankind on this earth is fellowship and relational fulfillment. In the same way, a wife is clearly and uniquely designed to be a mate to man, but God did not call Eve a mate to Adam, because that would suggest our primary purpose is procreation and sexual pleasure. God said Adam needed a helper because it places the primary emphasis on the shared <coughs> mandate to keep to work and keep God's creation under the man's leadership. Now we're going to unpack what the shared mandate is later, but I want you to notice the first thing that God says is not good is what? It's not good for man to be alone, right? What happens when guys are alone? <laughs> I'm eating, joking, watching, rowing, she wouldn't promote stomach. This is what happens when guys are alone. When we live alone, or parents go out of town, there's no one else in the picture. We end up eating mac and cheese and chicken nuggets for every single meal, like you posted yesterday, and like nothing gets put away, nothing gets cleaned. It's kind of like, I like my shower fuzzy. You know, we just, that's how guys are. When guys are alone, society falls apart, man. We are dirty, inappropriate people, and when we are on our own, we have no one to keep us in check, and suddenly everything gross becomes normal, all right? That's what happens when guys get alone. When April is not at home on Friday and I'm home alone, I'm scrambling at about 2.30 to finish all my chores that I was supposed to do all day long. Instead of just sitting back in my jammies, watching Sports Center and playing on my iPad, like, oh crap, I have stuff I gotta do, you know? And this is how it is when you're in college, too. You got, I didn't wash my sheets my entire first semester of college because I didn't know I was supposed to. <laughs> I took them home, there was an outline of my body on my sheets. It was disgusting, and my mom was like, you gotta wash your sheets. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Not good for man to be alone. All right? But I think I don't need to make that case any more clearly. All right, guys, we know we're gross. We know we're incapable of stuff on our own. All right? It's not good for man to be alone. But then check it out. In 19 and 20, verse uh, chapter 2, what does God do? It says, he brought the wild animals to Adam for him to name them. All right, so he notices it's not good for man to be alone, so what's he do? He's just parading everything in front of him, name this, find something, find a companion here. And it's kind of like porcupine, oh, I wish I had someone to tell me that was a bad idea, you know? And then like dogs come in, it's like, oh, this is kind of cool, like a companion going on, but that is not good enough. So that's when God says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And this is great because he brought the wild animals to Adam, and then after Adam wakes up, he brings Eve to him. Now imagine this. Comes out of a deep sleep. 
and he's been like petting tigers and elephants and all this stuff, and then he sees a woman coming to him from the fog, just like, you know, whatever. I don't know, God probably over to the guitar like, yeah, this is where it gets good, <laughs> you know? Like, it's one of those moments in history where, like, everything is right. And when God brought the woman to Adam, he composed poetry, and he started just going, like, he says, I'm going to color, whoa, man. <laughs> you know, like, he just has one of those reactions where it's like, this is sweet. This is so much better than a chinchilla, you know? Like, Adam is, like, just, he, he composes poetry. He writes the first song, and I think you guys will be distracted by that, so I'm going to move it on, all right? So what happens is God brings the woman and brown chicken, brown cow. We have marriage by God's design as male and female created in God's image as suitable mutual partners in a relationship that began with a spontaneous song in which God encourages them to have lots and lots of sex so they can have kids and bada boom bada bing now we have family. This is how it all began. This is the joy and the blessing of God's creation. See, God designed marriage. God blessed marriage in order to create God-honoring families. So where some people might want to say, yeah, but marriage is a joke today. And just look, look at the next page. This perfection falls apart literally in the next paragraph. And some people will want to point to that and say, man, divorce rate is so high, there's no way I'm going to dabble in marriage. Marriage is a joke. Marriage is a bad idea. All that stuff. I hear it a lot. But the fact is, is if you look at the creation story and you look at the origin of families, you see that marriage is such a good idea that Satan attacked it first. He didn't go after gravity. He didn't go after thermodynamics. He didn't go after dogs and cats and, and squirrels and all that. He didn't go after the way that apple trees make apples. He didn't go after any of that stuff. It's when man and woman come together in perfect relationship that God designed that he's like, you know what? That is too good to leave alone. So Satan tapped marriage first because it's such a good idea. And why is that? Well, there's another key feature to this creation account in the origin of family that's called the masculine mandate. And I want to unpack that for you guys now. Okay, so we're going to talk about this thing called masculine mandate from chapter 2, verse 15, all right? I need a guy with a real deep voice to read this because it just sounds cooler that way. 2.15, who's got it? Pierce, you got it. Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work, fit, and care for Okay, this isn't one of those verses where people, like revival breaks out and it gets put on coffee cups. But there's a lot in this that helps us understand our roles in marriage, in God's creative order, all right? Um, the first thing you see, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. He put him there on purpose. Adam didn't start out in the garden. His, his, his life was not one marked with quests for adventure and self-discovery. God put him there for a reason. And that's something transferable to us, is that the families that we are in right now, God put us there for a reason. No matter what the situation or the background or the current state of affairs, whatever it is, our family, even as demented as they may be and confused as they may be, that is where God wants us on purpose for right now. Why? Who knows? That's a big part of discovery. But he puts us there for his glory and for your joy. So, fellas and ladies, if, if your dad is a rock star, or if your dad is just ridiculous. And it's, it is of the greatest urgency that men understand and embrace a biblical idea of leadership. Because, and this comes from Richard Phillips' book, a church with a strong masculine presence will have a strong feminine beauty about it as well. So understand biblical leadership and look at the great example of your dads and make it better. Look at the poor examples of your dads and make it better. That is what we, as men, are called to do. All right? And, and this, this is God's perfect design for mankind. All right? And, and, and marriage. And Satan, what he does is in the story here, he attacks it the exact opposite way. Right? 
God speaks to the man. God puts the man in the garden and says, do this. Satan comes around and he attacks the woman first. He goes the opposite direction because I'm convinced that Satan is afraid of men who live under the masculine mandate of God. He doesn't come to Adam first. He's afraid of that because there's a chance for him to be obedient to God. He goes instead the reverse order. See, there is great freedom from anxiety, and there's great freedom from frustration when we start to operate the way God designed us. So as we talk about this, ladies, I want you to listen with these kind of ears as a, this is more of a list of what you're looking for in a man someday, okay? This is, this is key, and I'm not harping on this just because, like, oh, man, here's how we do it. This, this is the order that it happens in Scripture. And when men are men, women are free to be women. When there is a strong masculine identity in the church, there is a strong feminine beauty as well. All right? And I don't want us to get these things confused where we're filling roles and positions that God never intended for us to have. So, ladies, when you hear this stuff, think, yeah. That is exactly what I want in a man someday. When I when you start thinking marriage, when you start thinking the one and, and all this stuff, use this as like your plumb line for who you're talking to. Because there are way too many Christian boys and not enough godly men. It's extremely important we understand God's design for marriage and family in order to know the blessing that God pronounces over them. Okay? So here then is what this masculine mandate means. Look at verse 2.15. What does it say the reason is that God put Adam in the garden? To work and take care of it. Okay? So there is, <laughs> there is so much in that small phrase about what we as men are called to do and what you as women are craving from guys that just refuse to show up. Work and take care Work, first of all, fellas, you've got to understand this. We were designed to work. This is part of our original DNA. Work is not part of the curse of sin. We were designed to be producers and be productive and to make things and work hard and to not be lazy slobs whose only claim to fame is a very high Xbox score. That is not our job. Our job is to work. Our job is to be productive men who contribute things, not only to the family that we're in, but to the family that we will one day lead, okay? We don't sit around and let things just fall apart. That's what happens when we're alone. We're called right now. We are designed right now to work. This is a quote from the same book. A man's fingers should be accustomed to working in the soil of the human heart as well. So we don't just get addicted to office hours and say, well, I've got to finish this deadline. i got to keep things in the black. i got to make sure that I can provide for my family. Yes, you do. But you also got to take care of your family. you also got to have the heart of your children, the heart of your wife, not just the accolades of your boss. Trust me. This is a great one, too. It says a man is not only to wield the plow, but also to bear the sword. And tell me that it doesn't stir something inside you. We're not called just to work, we're also called to take care. We're called to become that raging grizzly bear of some of the our family. God allows that. God blesses that. God tells us that's exactly what I want you to be. This happened to my family not too long ago, right before Christmas uh, nighttime. I was upstairs playing with my girls. Doorbell rings. April goes down and answers the door, and it's a guy that's going door to door selling magazines. Total scam. Total sham. All right, and you just smell that in the air. It's like, this is a con. And she's standing there, like, talking to him, you know, the door kind of half open. And I'm coming downstairs to check it out. And on my way down the stairs, I see his foot come into my house. And what do you think that this happens to me on the inside? Like, my hair is standing up on end right now. Because that was that, that Papa Bear moment where, hey, we'll come up here real quick. You don't have to say anything. Just come up here. Okay? <laughs> All right, so, like, you're standing right here, like, this is the door. Okay? And I'm coming down the stairs, and I see this guy's foot advancing towards my bride, and I'm just like, you know what? Here we go. And I just kind of pushed her behind, and I, I kind of stood real big, you know, like right in front of him. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, you can sit down. You know, I just kind of, kind of squared off, 
And I'm like, I don't know what is about to happen right now, but I'm willing to kill you if I have to. <laughs> you know, like, it was just, that what was going on inside my body, inside my heart, inside this God-given design. That not only do I work here, make money, pay for my house, pay for my kids' school, fill the pantry, that kind of stuff. But I'm also willing to push my wife aside, keep my kids upstairs, and throw down with whoever's trying to come into my house. A man does not just wield the plow, but he also wields the sword. That is what we are called to do. You don't got to fight everybody you see. It's like, hey, jerk, you want to fight? You don't got to do that. Okay? But you are willing to protect your family at all costs at any moment. Okay? Sometimes I take this a little too far. And it's like, you cut me in line at McDonald's. You know? And just kind of go nuts. And I'm repenting of that constantly. Um, but the thing is, guys, our, our basic mandate as Christian men is to cultivate, build, grow, both things and people, but it's also to stand guard. Go sell those cinnamon rolls, guys. Make lots of money for Nicaragua. Hey, but, our, but it's also to, to stand guard so that the people and things are kept safe, so that the fruit past cultivating and nurturing is preserved. Okay? Hey, let's look back at verse 15. Who's got it? You guys there? Chapter 2, verse 15. Okay, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. And I said this already, that God puts us in families. But he also puts us in marriages that he expects us to work for and protect. And this is great. It says, a wife is the garden a godly husband works and keeps. And her growth in spiritual beauty should be among his chief delights. And about children, he says, a man is called to work the hearts of his children that they might become fertile soil for the gospel and devotion to Christ. This is what we're called to. This is how God designed it. So that was a lot of words, and for some of us that have a hard time tracking with a lot of that, here's a summary for you guys to latch on to and take. Basically what this mandate is, is that everything that's under our care is kept safe. Everything that's under our care is kept safe. Okay, and, and that doesn't mean like someday when you have your own family, that means right now when you have a phone, or a car, or you're dating somebody, or you have a little sister, or, you know, like everything that's under your care is kept safe. So some homeboy wants to come and, and ask Kinsley to go out on a date, I'm going to check his phone first and see if it's cracked. It's like, you can't take care of your phone, you're not taking care of my daughter. It may be extreme, but hey, work on it. Show that you can be faithful to the little things, okay? So as we wrap this up, expecting men to be men was God's idea. Work was God's idea. Marriage was God's idea. Sex was God's idea. Having babies and raising children was God's idea. And God blessed marriage so that it's actually fun and fruitful. And marriage is such a good idea that Satan tapped it first. And in the story, it all starts with the family. That's why we're here. That's why we're focusing on family for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> because every one of us, I mean, you just look around this room, every one of us has a very, very different family dynamic, a very different story in our own families. Because some of our families are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them are good. You know, we all have different family stories. But in terms of what a family could be, and in terms of what the family is designed to be, we all have the exact same story. We have the same call. We have the same hope. And we have the same God who is getting when marriage and family.